Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Hope you all are doing well. Um, <clears throat> let me take a moment here, pull up our prayer list. Um, before we get into some songs that I've selected, and I guess I need to pull out a song book since we won't have slides. You may want to do the same. Um, but let's uh, begin with a prayer. Uh, of course, I'd like us to remember the Grow family in prayer. Uh, the funeral for Miss Elizabeth will be tomorrow. Uh, so let's be keeping them in prayer. And are there any other prayer requests we have tonight that we'd like to uh, lift up to God? Ron? Okay, I'm glad he's feeling a little bit better. Yeah. Um, also, uh, I mentioned this morning a prayer request for my niece, Emily, and they are still at the hospital, uh, but her blood sugar, which was super high this morning, has come down significantly. Part of that's because she hasn't eaten anything since this morning, but um, that's about really all I know right now. And so they're still in the hospital. They are going to keep her overnight. Um, so I'd like to, us to continue to pray for my niece, Emily. Any other prayers of praise or prayer requests for tonight? What is her name? Okay. All right, Ruth Blevins. We'll be sure to pray for her. Okay, well, if there's no other prayer requests, then bow with me and let's uh, go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for uh, this morning uh, that we had in worship, and we thank you that we're together this evening as well. Thank you for bringing us back, and uh, we pray that you'll bless this time that we spend uh, singing to you and, and also discussing some of the things we talked about uh, this morning, about how to represent you well uh, to the world and how to do that together as a church family. Father, we want to lift up the names we mentioned tonight, those who need you in different ways. We especially right now want to lift up the Grow family and the passing of Miss Elizabeth. Um, we're thankful for the, the long life of faith that she lived, and we're thankful that the family can take comfort in knowing that she's with you. Uh, but we also want to pray that you'll bless them as they'll miss her and bless them in their grief. Father, we also want to pray your blessings on uh, Ronnie, who's been sick, we're grateful that he's beginning to feel some better, but please continue to bless him and bless his wife, Stephanie, uh, with her various health challenges, and we ask that you'll continue to watch over her health. Uh, we want to lift up my niece, Emily, who's uh, in Florida and in the hospital, and they're going to be keeping her overnight. Uh, we ask that you will uh, comfort and, and strengthen uh, her and be with her parents, as this is a scary and unexpected thing, and uh, pray that <clears throat> the doctors and nurses who were taking care of Emily, will have wisdom and guidance, and that she'll be all right and can come home soon. Uh, Lord, we also want to lift up uh, Miss Ruth Blevins and the passing of her husband. Uh, we ask that you will surround her and comfort her. We pray that her church family can be there for her, and <clears throat> we pray that you will also be walking with her as she, um, as she moves on and continues to live on without her husband. We pray that you'll comfort her. Father, again, bless our time uh, together tonight. We ask that this is a, a fruitful discussion for us, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, uh, I had not planned on looking up the song numbers, so give me a moment um, here. Uh, the first song I wanted us to sing, since we were thinking about uh, representing Christ and, and how to do that in a way that gives him honor and glory and can draw people to him, show him his character, First song I thought of was Let the Beauty of Jesus Be Seen in Me, which is number 392, if you'd like to turn there. 392. <clears throat> we'll sing first, third, and fourth uh, verses. <clears throat> Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. 
all his wonderful passion and purity. May his spirit divine all my being refine. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. When somebody has been so unkind to you, some word spoken that pierces you through and through, think how he was beguiled, spat upon and reviled. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in you. From the dawn of the morning to close of day, in example, in deeds, and in all you say, lay your gifts at his feet, ever strive to keep sweet. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in you. next song I'd like us to sing <clears throat> is Take My Life and Let It Be, which is, let's see, take my, I think it's number 612. <clears throat> it may not be, though. It's number 613. 612 and 613 are just different melodies, and I'm familiar with 613. Uh, I know it has six verses, which is awfully long, but every single verse fits so perfectly with, um, with this morning's uh, sermon. And so if you're, if you're willing, I'd like us to just sing through all six. Uh, the lyrics are so beautiful, and so I encourage you to focus on them as we sing. <clears throat> Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. Amen. I know um, that's a, a good number of verses. But um, it's just such a beautiful song, so thank you for singing that with me. Um, <clears> the <throat> third song was a song that originally it was only on the screen, so I'm going to pick an, another one here. Turn to number 950. This is a beautiful song that we haven't sung in a while, uh, Lamb of God, <clears throat> number 950. <clears throat> Here's 
Your only Son, no sin to hide, but you have sent Him from your side to walk upon this guilty sod and to become the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O wash me in His precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Your gift of love they crucified. They laughed and scorned him as he died. The humble king they named a fraud and sacrificed the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O oh, wash me in His precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost, I should have died, but You have brought me to Your side to be led by your staff and rod, and to be called a Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O wash me in his precious blood, till I am just a Lamb of God. Amen. <clears throat> so this morning, uh, we talked about the mission that the church has. Uh, the mission can be summed up in a lot of ways. There's the Great Commission to go, all, to go out into all the world and, and uh, make disciples from all nations. We can talk about the mission to evangelize. Um, and the way I summed it up this morning that I think is more inclusive than just, just speaking the words of the gospel, but, but making that part of a larger whole, is representing Christ. We're called to represent Christ to the world. That's what the church is. Uh, the church is the body, uh, and, and as we sang in Take My Life and Let It Be, uh, we want to be the hands and feet of Jesus, and we want to... Um, to, to shine his light. He's the light of the world, and he's called us to be the lights of the world. We're called to represent him. And I focused on two different times especially when we can represent. Uh, when someone comes into our midst, and also when we go out, when we go out into the world. And so for tonight, I wanted to just ask a couple questions where maybe we could get a little practical about how to do this, about how to represent him well. Uh, some hands-on things. And so first, I was thinking in terms of when a visitor comes in. I don't know when the last time was that you visited a church. Maybe it's when you were looking for a church home, or maybe it's when you're out on the road on a vacation and you stop somewhere to worship for that Sunday. Um, or maybe you're with family and they worship at a church, and so you go to church with them uh, while you're with your family for a holiday or something. But I want to take a moment to just put ourselves in a visitor's shoes uh, so that we can best reach out to visitors when they come to us. So think back to times where you've visited churches. And I want us to think about what were some, some good experiences you had visiting churches? What were some negative experiences you had? And what things happened to make them that way? What, what about a church makes it a good experience where you visit and you think, wow, this is a church family that's truly focused on being the church God has called them to be. And then also what things happened at, when maybe you visited a church and you thought, wow, I don't think I'm too excited about going back there again. But what have been some of your experiences, good and bad, in visiting churches? Somebody listening might, might really want to hear what you have to say. So thanks, Dale. I think so, yes. 
I guess the most important thing to me, are they preaching the truth? Mm. Yes. That's first and foremost with me. But my older brother, he was, I, th I think, I don't want to use the word bad, but he, any church he went into, he would look for negatives first. Mm. And I kept telling him, won't you look for positive things you see? And sometimes we get caught up in looking for negative. Yeah, absolutely. So, Dale, when you say a church that preaches the truth, of course, all of God's word is true, and it says a lot on a lot of different things. So, what in particular, when you say the truth, is especially on your mind when you say that? Well, it, it really disturbs me if they don't place value for remission of sins in baptism. Mm. Or they serve the Lord's Supper once a month or every quarter. Those two mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Baptism, Lord's Supper, those are two central practices of the church. Yeah. Did I see your hand go up, Bob, out of the corner of my eye? Great. Uh, if you could pass the microphone over. Probably if they have a handsome minister. Oh, yeah. I, I wish we had one of those. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Ron. I had something I had, uh, wanted to say. Uh, I used to go down to uh, Somerset Church of Christ once in a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, down there, they served the communion on Sunday morning and also on Sunday night. And But that's the only congregation I've ever been to that it does that mm -hmm. and it don't say anything about not doing it mm -hmm. and but I thought it was you know entirely different you know yeah. to go to a congregation like that that is interesting you know, yeah. I don't think I've ever been in a congregation that fully served it on both occasions of course we yeah. offer it here if someone hasn't taken it uh -huh. but interesting yeah yeah thanks for sharing that go ahead Bob yes I can relate to that Ron but people visit their guests, they're looking for two things, in my opinion. They're looking for the true church, and they're looking for friendliness, if that makes sense. They're looking for something. If you don't have, if you, got the, if you, if you have the truth, and, you don't, if, and if you're not friendly, they will probably not be back. Mm. But if you have both, that's what they're looking for. They will probably yeah. pitch their tent there. But we can have one or the other and not both, then they, they won't be back. Yeah. I, I have seen that happen. That's a great observation. It's like reminds me of what Paul says about speaking the truth in love. And if one of those ingredients is missing, something's really wrong. Yeah. Go ahead, Mary. We uh, visit a lot of different congregations. And before we came here, we were to say it. That's how I knew Ernestine and Dan. Uh, those people are nice. I mean, there's some really nice people there. Great. And, uh, I mean, we all went out to lunch and everything. The only problem, I mean, they were friendly. They were really friendly. Yeah. Aaron's team and Dan even came by the house. They said, we're going to come and talk to you and let you know what the church is like. Oh, that's well, great. You know, you come to my house, you're going to eat. So I said, come to dinner. Yeah, <laughs> so I've said, been to dinner. Said, <laughs> yeah, I know what that's like. <laughs> so they came to dinner. And yeah. then when they finished telling us about the church and you know, everything, some of their beliefs I didn't, we just didn't agree with. But we still, you know, we still love them, you know, of course, and everything. Yeah. But that church was really friendly. Yeah. That we went to one up north, <laughs> and we walked in. Nobody said anything. I mean, yeah. they just kind of looked at us and felt, um, "Am I overdressed? Am I underdressed? Or what?" Yeah. They just looked. They just stared at us. But then the guy got up and he started talking. They were northern. They they were friendly people, but they just didn't show it. <laughs> he got he got up and they was having a, some kind of potluck or something that evening. Yeah. We didn't stay, of course, but they invited us to stay and then they you know they was like oh, all I guess we really want you to stay and I thought well why did you even talk to me when I came in you know so it's just different I guess where you where you go and what part of the country you yeah go yeah cultural differences are, are part of it too yeah um, go ahead Sue 
I think probably the first thing would be the friendliness because there's some people out there that are searching for a church. There's people that do not know the truth. So if we get them, if they come in and we talk to them and truly invite them to come back and, and to be friendly with them, mm-hmm. even if they don't know the truth, yeah. they're going to come back because we showed them love. Because mm-hmm. I can remember before I ever started going to Church of Christ, I'd always gone to Baptist, and it was the lady across the street that got me going. And the thing was, no matter when I saw her, she was just, I don't know, just something about her. I guess Christ-like. It was something that I would look at her and I'd say, I don't know what it is she has, but I want whatever she's got. If it'll make me as calm and happy. and So I did go to church with her. And yes, I was amazed. They were very friendly. Mm -hmm. And the teaching... Like I said, I had gone to Baptist. I'd gone to every church there was from a child up because I was not raised in a Christian family. And listening to Andy Baker over in Danville. And I thought, his teaching is different. It's not what I've heard before. Hmm. And, of course, the friendliness made me want to come back. Yeah. And going back and hearing him speak the truth, yeah. that's what change things for me. Mm. So I think just when the person comes in, yes, you've got to give them a reason to want to come back yeah. if they don't know the truth. Yeah. Even if they just want to come back because you're inviting them and you're friendly and you, you have something. Mm-hmm. And then they'll learn the truth. That makes me think, Sue, of um, I've sometimes I like to like listen to podcasts and things like that and sometimes I'll, I'll be listening to one where someone who maybe was an atheist earlier in life and then became a Christian. Sometimes they're these really like, you know, uh, sometimes they're people who really have thought, tried to think this through as much as they could before they made that conversion. And, and I've heard multiple times that a lot of the classic arguments for the truthfulness of Christianity, like it's not that they don't like them, but they didn't really find them super duper helpful for them. But what they found was the more they just got to know the character of God, that drew them in more than any logical argument did. It was the relational element that really helped them bridge that gap and and come to know Christ. And if we think about people who don't know the Lord at all and they come in to be with us, well, the closest thing they're going to have to a relationship with God is through forming relationships with his people. We can be kind of the first, first port of call, so to speak, so that they can then go to know God for themselves. Um, And that's often what's going to draw people in more than just pure argumentation or logic. And and so that takes me back to what Bob was saying. I I don't mean to keep rambling here, but, or Mary, I'm sorry, you mentioned two different churches um, and the one you went to that was not so friendly. Well, I don't know too much about that church, so let's just say hypothetically, say that they taught like everything just completely correct but you didn't really have any type of connection with them, that's probably not going to be the most appealing church. Whereas the other church you mentioned, you had a few things that you kind of disagreed with them on, but wow, they were great people. And, um, you know, when it comes to things we might disagree on, I think we have to to have wisdom and, and choose, all right, the things that we disagree on, are these things fundamentals of the faith or are they things where... I love these people so much, I'm willing to work with them in spite of the disagreements because there's so much good happening here. And, and, and I think we know what the answer would be. Which of those ter- two churches would you rather be at? I think we all know. We'd rather be at the one where we have some disagreements, but they're so, they're so uh, Christ-like. And that, I think, tells us something about how to best win people. It's not always through being right on every single thing. It's, it's through that relational uh, connection. Uh, Joe. Something triggered my tears the first time I came here. I'm not going to say what, but, um, and Sue and Doris, 
They brought Kleenex and sat with me the whole time. Aww. <laughs> and the following week, Sue came to my daughter's house where I was living at the time, and she brought a basket of goodies, and she was so friendly. And I mean, yeah. that's it. Yeah. I wanted to be part of it. That's so wonderful. Thanks for sharing that. Any other thoughts on when you visited churches? I'm not asking this in general. I'm asking this so that we can think about when visitors come to our church. Uh, things that have been positive or negative experiences or, or that you'd like to share. Yeah. But um, when Chris and I were, were seeing each other and had met his family, had met his parents, and I was like, we got to go to church together. I was going to Southland at the time, and he waited and he waited, and I was like, it was so frustrating. And he said, well, that's my family. <laughs> so he wanted to wait before he, I met his family, his church family. And so um, he brought me on a Sunday night. I'll never forget. I will never forget it. Mary was doing her little dance. Like, she was like, who is this? <laughs> and I, like, came up to me. And I, um, Ernie, he was, like, he was just grinning, Sue. Um, and I, until, I mean, I'm being sincere. I didn't know what the Holy Spirit was until I saw it in action, and it was bad enough. Mm. And so you, you know, the fruits of the Spirit, love, you know, the fruits of the Spirit are, but love is an action. It's not just a word and a feeling. So it was expressed, and that is, it, that is extremely true for me because I didn't grow, like where I just grew up by listening to what the, whoever was in the pulpit, whatever they said, I went with. Yeah. And I didn't, um, uh, so I didn't even, like, read the scripture like I, I should have mm. until, you know, Chris and I got together and he challenged me, like, big time. And now it's, like, a <laughs> hunger. And so it's, like, not just the, the being, you know, friendly and accepting me as family as soon as, like, first night, but a hunger to to really get into God's work yeah. because it was so different. Yeah. That's great. A um, couple just reflections on what you were saying. The first thing that stuck out to me is you mentioned three different people who came up. Yeah. And that's a big difference from going to a church and like, well, one person said hello to me. And when you get multiple people coming up, that suggests, all right, this is not just I happened upon a nice person at this church. There's a pattern here to suggest something about the character of this entire congregation. Um, and, and that's said, make sure and come back. I remember that. Oh, great, great. <laughs> that's so important because it can be very easy. Uh, like we had a couple of visitors here today, and, and w any given Sunday we can have a couple. It can be very easy to think, oh, I hope someone talks to them. And then you see someone talking to them and think, okay, good, all right, then, then they're okay. Please do not think that way. Like if someone talks to them, that's wonderful, but it really does need to be more than one person. That they need to get a sense for what the entire church family is like, and um, we will bless them so much more if if we also, even if someone else is already doing it, if we also go out of our way to to let them know that we love that they're here. Yeah. Second thing I thought is you, when you're talking about you didn't know much about the Holy Spirit, but you just felt like you saw it in action here. I think we'd all agree we all don't know a lot about the Holy Spirit. It's, it's easily the most mysterious member of the Trinity. And there are a lot of questions people have about how it works. And, when you know, there's a lot of questions people have about it. And maybe one day we'll talk about it. But you can kind of, you can, I think we can all take some comfort in knowing, even when we know so little about it, you can see it in action. Right? The fruit of the Spirit is not complicated. Uh, love, joy, peace, patience. And when we see it in action... That's a wonderful thing. Uh, even if there's a lot we don't know, there, there it is when you see it in action. That's, that's beautiful. Uh, yeah, Bob and then Jason as well. well we, yeah, the microphone's closer, so let's go back there and then back over to you, Bob. Uh, 
Yeah, I guess, you know, I can only, I guess, really speak to it from a, because I do think there are, are differences in, in having Christians visit versus non-Christians. I think yeah. there's a little bit of a difference there. So just speaking from a Christian, um, you know, going to a new congregation, trying to find that home, of course, we've done that here. But we've, you know, we've moved around a few times, right, and, and I guess, you know, explored different congregations in different areas. Um, I, I agree with Mary, you know, having spent time up north, um, the people are, it, it, they're different. They're very nice and loving and friendly people, but they just don't show it like in, in a way that we do like here. Mm. Um, and it's okay. You just have to recalibrate to, yeah. <laughs> to that level. Um, but, y you know, maybe to Dale's point, I mean, I, I know when I go somewhere, I'm, I'm more interested in making sure that what I'm seeing is 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 what I feel like is is you know that truth right. Yeah. And that I also like to see an organized um, worship service. Mm -hmm. You know, if if you've ever gone somewhere and it's it's kind of chaotic and you can tell just things aren't very well planned, um, it's not the end of the world, but it certainly isn't appealing, right? To yeah. have to sort of fumble through that. Yeah. Um, so I think that's something that you know we can we can do, and, and I think we do a yeah. pretty good job here. Um, so I think that's something that's important, but I also have had kind of a negative experience as well. Um, and, and, you know, I know one congregation that we visited, you know, decided on a, on a particular Sunday morning to take up, a, an issue that they were having mm. a, amongst members. Yeah. And th there's certainly a time and place for that, right? And it depends yeah. on the issue. I, my, my personal thought in this case, that issue just probably shouldn't really have been addressed at that at that time mm. um so it seemed a little bit inappropriate and that was kind of a a little bit of a setback if you will that i just yeah. i just didn't again just didn't think it was appropriate and especially the way that it was kind of handled by the i don't i don't know what his position was but yeah um it just didn't seem like it was handled very well so i think that was kind of a again just sort of a negative experience mm. mm -hmm. so yeah thanks for sharing that uh, while the microphone's going over to Bob, one thing I was thinking in response to what you said, Jason, you know, when, when, you, when you visit a church, and this applies to when people come here, you never know what's going to happen that Sunday, and it could be that something has come up that needs to be addressed that's quite important, and especially if you're not, like, you, you don't have any faith in God whatsoever, it might be really disorienting to see, like, why is this coming up, why are they handling it this way, or maybe if you're from a background where you're in a part of a denomination where churches just handle that stuff completely differently. And so even if it's confusing, if they can see, all right, this church has strived to handle it well and in a Christ-like spirit, even if there's a ton of questions, that's better than if you say, well, that, that was awfully unloving or uncomfortable or whatever. Um, I don't know, that just came to mind based on what you were saying, Jason. Uh, Bob. Uh, let's talk about this just a second. We have a guest come in, and we have, let's say we have a line of people who want to talk to that person. Is that good? Is it bad? I don't know. So how would you handle, how would we handle a situation like that? Mm. Because sometimes I have, we have guests, and I want to talk to that person, but you have other people standing waiting to talk to that person. Yeah, yeah. So I have to stand in line, per se. So do you just butt in and say who you are, introduce yourself, or you just wait, or you <laughs> yeah, it's just it's tough. Man. That is tough. So, uh, how would we handle a situation like that? Just out of curiosity. That's a great question. <laughs> Anybody have any? Th I mean, so I think I know what you're saying. Like when there's so many people who want to talk to someone, how do we handle that? I've got a couple thoughts, but I don't want to just immediately share them. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so make con like a friendly gesture to the acknowledgement, yeah. and then since there's so many that are already trying to you know engage, and then yeah. um, follow up because the first time it might be like that, but it might not probably won't be like that yeah. the second, third. If that's if, true, that's very know. true. If they come back, they probably won't be bombarded a second time or third time. <laughs> yeah. Well, and so one thing I was thinking is it kind of might depend on on the guests, mm -hmm. some people are very extroverted and would love to get bombarded. <laughs> some people 
and I, I've, I've encountered this a couple times when we have visitors here, like you can tell they're, they, they're perhaps rather introverted or maybe not even introverted, maybe they're just shy and people are coming up and it's, uh, they're kind of caving in on themselves <laughs> because so many people are coming. And so we might a little bit just try to have to have discernment based on each visitor. Um, and it's tough because it's not a super organized thing. Like hopefully if someone comes in and sits down, people just, when they're able, come. So it's, it, it can be a little disorganized. To some degree, it might be trusting and leaning on the Lord uh, to trust, you know. Uh, I'm not able to get to that person today, but I see a good number of people are. I'm going to trust that the right people are talking with that person. And, and if a door opens, we talked about opening doors this morning, if a door opens for me to join in greeting that person, then I will, but it may not open, you know. So there might be a degree to where we trust that something bigger is at work than just ourselves, you know. Hopefully the Lord is working in our midst. That's, that's a thought I had, Bob. I don't, I don't know. Anybody else have any other thoughts on that? Uh, Joe. this church yeah. uh, it welcomed children it welcomed I mean there's stuff for the seniors young adults in between you know uh, ladies devotional men's breakfast um, potlucks yeah uh, we're involved in the community and mission work and I think we got it all oh, I'm glad glad to hear you say that um, it's a lot to try to have it all, or at least have as much as you can, and um, hopefully each year we're trying to attend to those things as best we can. Yeah, thanks for sharing. For sharing. Um, I'm amazed that we spent such such good time on this one question when I prepared three. Uh, so I'm just going to ask the second one. We won't even get to the third one tonight, and this can be brief. Maybe even if it's only five minutes, that's okay. But I was talking about this morning also for when we go out, ways to represent Christ when we go out. And I threw out a few just examples, like when you're at a restaurant or, you know, when you're out with your family. Um, but maybe we could share some others, some practical ways when we're out in the world, living our lives, going about our day. What are some opportunities that maybe come across your path where you can represent Christ well? And maybe you'd like to share them so that we could all, you know, benefit from that. Are there any other examples beyond what I've mentioned this morning of just opportunities, doors that open, even if they're just tiny doors, doors that open for us to represent Christ well? Sue? I think our behavior, whether we are out with people or if we're talking on the telephone, Mm -hmm. It's our behavior, our attitude. It comes through all the time. Yeah. And I know there's been times I've been on the phone. And, you know, they'll put you on hold or whatever. And sometimes yeah. people would get very upset. Yeah. I always think it's not their fault. They're putting me on hold. I still try to be nice to them. Yeah. I still tell them to have a wonderful day. Good. Or God bless you. Or something like that. Because it's how we behave. And yeah. people see us. Yeah. And if we don't behave in a Christ-like manner, they wouldn't want to be around us. Yeah. Well, and that, so the same logic that would apply when a visitor comes, if we're not behaving in a Christ-like manner, they want to come back. It'll apply when we're out in the world, too. It's funny you mentioned being on the phone. That triggered a memory. I worked at a, at a, uh, a clinic for a year after Kelsey and I got married. It was a little clinic in, in, in the town where we lived. I was a secretary there, and one morning, I mean, I had to be there rather early in the morning, rather early for me, at least. Some of you think it's not very early, but I had to be there early. And, you know, it was Kelsey and I's first year of marriage, and I think something had come up in the morning that frustrated me, and I would, because, so that was inherently frustrating, and then I was a little late to work, and then it was swamped at the clinic, huge line. The phone rings, I pick it up, and <laughs> I'm like what <laughs> you know <laughs> I don't know I didn't say that but I wasn't and, and I was trying to help this person and this person just told me like well you're nice and cheery this morning and in a sort like she could tell I was not ha and I did not realize how much it was coming through in my voice and I don't remember what I said to her um, I don't even know where I'm going with that story but it occurred to me based on what you said a anybody else on other just little ways that may come up for us to represent Christ 
Bob. As you know, I go out every Mondays and Wednesdays mm. and volunteer. And I'm going to pick on Bill. Bill doesn't mind. Uh, <laughs> what has happened, I used to take uh, hot meals to the lady that Bill take care of. And she says to me one day, she says, are you a preacher? I said, no, ma'am, I'm just, a, I try to be a faithful member. She said, it was something about you that's different. She said, I knew that, about something about you was different. I was, I guess I've been seeing her for, for about six, seven months, I guess, maybe longer than that. And she said, I have some ties here that my husband died. I'm going to give those ties to you. I said, that's fine. And another occasion, I was up there trying to turn around in her yard. Bill truck was in the way. And she said, why don't I go out and ask Bill to move his truck out of the way so you can get these people bus by? I said, no, 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 no. Leave, leave, leave your neighbors alone because you always want to be nice to your neighbors. And one thing led to another. And you see Bill's here tonight on behalf of me being kind to the lady. And I think that's, uh, that speaks for itself. Mm. And uh, history has fulfilled itself today. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, Bob. Any other thoughts? Uh, Ron? Live with somebody, like if they're your wife, and she was raised in a situation where there was different churches she went to, uh, you know, all of her life, and then she goes to the church that we, or that I believe in, and uh, so then now it's, you know, it, like I said, it's frustrating. Mm. Uh, she uh, she believes in, I don't know, maybe music. I'm not sure, but. Uh, don't say to do that in our Bible, but it's hard to get away from, I guess, you know, being uh, doing that. Yeah. I know when it's no longer strangers, I, we were talking about str little ways a door's been open for us to represent Christ to strangers, but when it's no longer strangers and it's really close loved ones. I know it becomes very difficult. Yeah, it does. I'm sorry that is so hard. And of course, I, I run into people uh, different places here in town. And uh, I know this one man, I run into him, and he was saying, that all you have to do is just call on the name of the Lord. And I said, well, yeah, I know the Bible says that. But it also says you have to do a lot of other stuff, too. Not just that. Like repent. Yeah. <laughs> and we could also talk about baptism and other things. But yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that story about the rich man. Yeah, yeah. And all the stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really a sad situation. Of course, I know this country, you know, we're free to worship any way we want to and stuff. But there's a lot of folks that's misinformed or, or they've been yeah. raised different. And, yeah. It's hard to change. It. Yeah. Well, and it really is. this may this may be since it is 5:50 a, a fairly good note for us to end on with that. It, when when we live in a culture where there are so many different churches, and not just so many different churches, but so many different theologies and beliefs within each one, and on at least some of those on at least some of those issues, we feel like all right, like fundamental aspects of the gospel are being compromised here. And you have folks who have been raised in that background. They love that background. It's hard for them to perhaps see things from another perspective. Um, I think it's a, it is, first of all, fully appropriate to, to share our understanding of God's word with them, and I hope we'll do that. That's, that's what we should do. But there may also come a point where we have to, to accept that uh, if, if a 
change is going to happen. It's going to happen slowly. And there may also come a point where we realize they're in the Lord's hands and not ours. And we'll let him sort everything out, knowing he's just and also fully loving and gracious and merciful. And I think it's okay to reach that conclusion sometimes. I don't know if that's super helpful, but that is something that came to my mind. Uh, Brother Dale. Perhaps some of y'all have witnessed this personally. I worked with two men. One was a retired Navy captain. And um, he didn't profess anything. And 23 years, And when I moved down here, every time I go back to Pike County and go see him, I'd say, are you ready? No. Have you, have you worked with someone so long and, and so hard? Prayed about it? And then they they die. And you start questioning yourself, what could I have done different? What could I have said differently? But you know, the word does say work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But sometimes you need a push. <laughs> and, uh, but, yeah, that, that, that's really hurtful. It really is. That's all. Yeah. Thank you, Dale. That is, that is difficult. One thought, I, I know I said this kind of already a moment ago, but I may not have said it super well. I know this is a difficult topic. One thought to maybe end on that can be hopeful, even when thinking about these types of things. You know, someone passing away, and based on our understanding of God's word, they weren't ready, and these kinds of things. I think it's possible. I think we can do both of these things at the same time, to fully commit to appreciating God's truth and not compromising on it, teaching it and, and holding to it, while also trusting, knowing we don't actually fully know the mind of the Lord. And he, the decisions that he makes on the day of judgment, even if they surprise us, they will be right and they will be good. And um, I think that can give us some peace knowing they're in, they are in the best hands they could be in even even in those circumstances. So I hope that can give us some peace. Well, um, thank you all for a great discussion tonight. Thank you all for sharing. 
Um, is there anyone here who needs to take the Lord's Supper who wasn't able to take it this morning? All right. Um, if you would bow with me and let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Thank you, Father, again for bringing us together tonight. Uh, thank you for this time that we got to spend talking with one another about the important mission of representing you well to this world. Uh, Father, we ask that you help us to be mindful of um, when someone comes into our midst. Perhaps they're looking for a church home. Perhaps they're passing through. Perhaps they've never stepped foot in a church before. We, don't, we just don't know those things when they come in. We pray that uh, regardless, they will see Christ in us, that they will see the fruit of the Spirit being born abundantly here, and that they'll hear the truth of God's Word being spoken uh, that they'll see that this is a church that uh, not only wants to speak the truth, but wants to speak it in love, and also a church that wants to act it out, that has a mission and a focus and a way that it, it conducts itself, that is moving forward and bringing more souls to you, moving forward and becoming more and more like the people you call us to be. And Father, we pray that when we go out, whether we're out with Christian brothers and sisters or with our families or even just out by ourselves, we pray that when we go out... Um, that our words and actions will reflect you well. We ask that you'll open doors for us uh, and that you'll help us to walk through them. And uh, that may even lead to opportunities to directly tell someone the, the gospel. And we pray that whatever types of doors open and however much they open, even maybe they're just cracked open or maybe they're blown wide open, we just pray that you will give us the wisdom and courage uh, and Christ-likeness to, to walk through them and be the people you call us to be. And, Father, we know that um, this is very important. It's, it's not just a matter of getting people in a church building so our attendance can get higher and those types of things. This is, this is good news, but it's, it's news with eternal significance. And so we pray that uh, you will bless us to take that seriously, uh, while also we pray for that peace that passes understanding, that we trust that um, you're going to sort everything out uh, when your son returns and... Um, that, that you will make the judgments that are right and good and just and also loving and gracious. And uh, we just pray that we faithfully walk in the steps of your son so that on that day we hear you say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, we love you so much. Bless us as we head out into this week. Uh, bring us back together uh, Wednesday if possible or next Sunday so that we can be refreshed and uh, continue to live faithfully for you. In Jesus' name, amen.